last portfolio company of the day. Um, so I will first start by um, introducing Mark Sagar and Greg Cross, founders of Soul Machines, a world-leading research company in biologically inspired AI. And while they are getting uh, mixed up, I will also pre-introduce um, their moderator of this afternoon, who is Connor Mitchell, an explorer, lifelong learner, and a current data science student at the prestigious Minerva Schools at KGI in San Francisco. And let's see now if our next company is ready. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm Mark Sager. I'm going to be talking about the technological foundations of what we're doing. And then I'll be followed by Greg Cross, who will talk about the business side of what, what we're doing. Uh, we've come all the way from the other side of the planet to talk to you guys today. So, um, um, so I'm looking forward to the talk very much. So if you think about it, human cooperation and creativity are the most powerful forces in history. Think about the thousands of people that had to act together and all the innovations which had to be made to get humans onto the moon. And you think about those thousands of people using products developed by millions of people in order to create that. And it's truly incredible. And it's possible because we are so good at cooperating. So I put it to you that creative cooperation with intelligent machines will define the next era of history. But how do we build machines that can cooperate like and with people? And how do we build machines that are creative like people? Did you know that the first computer already had these abilities? Does anybody know what the first computer was? It was a human. The term computer was actually coined in the 17th century for one who computes. But then during the war and all kinds of things, you'd actually have people working alongside with calculating machines. And those people could be creative, they could talk to each other, they could raise problems, they could do all kinds of things, which in a way, if you start looking at the evolution of you know, looking at computers today, we've kind of lost some of these really key elements, these sort of intuitive skills. So our company, Soul Machine's goal is to humanize computing. We want to recover some of these human-like qualities, these soft skills that people are so good at, so that we can make machines more powerful, easier to use, more intuitive to work with, and more creative. So we're doing that. We're approaching this by creating autonomous animation. So it's simulating human-like behavior and learning so that you can interact with the machine like a person. So autonomous animation is the ability for a virtual character to generate its own behavior in real time and adapt to an ever-changing environment, which is like what we do. You think about the complexity of human behavior. When you behave, your behavior is determined by you know, how you're feeling, are you tired or not, but also your memories, how you're interacting with other people, and it's this constantly evolving interaction. And when we're cooperating, we're balancing all of these things. We're constantly getting feedback. So what we've been developing is basically an artificial nervous system to interconnect all kinds of different sensors and effectors, and a dynamic biologically-based simulation to basically generate the, the life force of that, pretty much how the information flows together and coordinates. So with autonomous animation, you can think of it as a, as a scale, really going from level zero, which is kind of like a recording or a triggered, triggered playback, all the way up to what we call level five, which is actually a self-aware computer. So you, you, these are all layers of how a machine can operate itself. Now, in order to build autonomous animation, which works like a human, we use the best template that we have, which is the human brain and nervous system. So with our digital humans, what we do is we build models which can, they can touch through the screen, they can hear through the microphone, they can see through the web camera, 
they can imagine things and plan things, and they can behave in human-like ways, all so that we can relate to it and understand what they're doing so that they can better interact with us. And they can learn. They can learn through experience. They can also do actions. So, and they even can feel in a way. It's just numbers, but nevertheless, you can develop certain forms of even digital empathy where the machine will respond based on your emotional state. So the brain model that we're building has many, many different functions. I don't have time to talk through them today. But you can see there's a lot of complicated features which come together. And nature's really balanced this incredibly. So to give a sort of schematic of what we're doing, the way that we built the model is kind of based on neuroanatomy. It's, we have a brain stem in the model, which does reflexes. We've got an amygdala, which is doing emotional association. We've got a hippocampus doing episodic memory. We've got a cortex doing all kinds of decision-making functions. And it's feeding back to virtual muscles, which then drive the behavior. Now, in our R&D, we really look at what it takes to basically embody cognition. So we build cognitive models, and we put them in digital models that you can interact with. And so to do that, we combine theories from neuroscience, human simulation like biomechanics, and developmental psychology to really look at how people develop. And so one of our projects is called Baby X, which is this digital baby here. And we look at different models of interaction with that, like how do babies learn when we're interacting with them, and so forth. So I'll just play you a little video which is going to show you aspects of Baby X. <coughs> this is Baby X. She's one of the most advanced brain simulations in the world, and she's enjoying playing a peekaboo game with me. So what is Baby X? It's a virtual infant simulation. It's trying to create the elements which put together aspects of what makes something lifelike. Baby X isn't an animation. She's a virtual human, and all of the behaviors are generated by neural networks. She watches and listens to what I do and makes her own decisions in real time about how to respond. If I teach her that this is a duck using associative learning, then something amazing happens that we do as well. We just take it completely for granted. Now watch what happens in Baby X's brain when I say the word duck to her. Duck. Her brain builds a link between the word duck and an actual duck. We can see that Baby X is looking at the spider and there's no reaction. But I'm now going to tell her it's something she should be scared of. <sighs> Scary spider. The spider now provokes a clear fear response. The sight of the spider triggers specific parts of her brain. Her amygdala initiates a cascade of reactions which send chemicals into her system generating the physical and emotional feelings of fear. When we take the spider away, she calms down. And when we bring it back, we can see she's now scared of it. When Baby X presses the green button, a duck appears. And when she presses the red button, a snake appears. As Baby X continues to press the buttons, her brain begins to form new connections. She wants to see a duck, so she's working out pressing the green button gets her what she wants. This ability to learn sequences and to predict what might be about to happen next is crucial to everything we do. We all know that making eye contact is a powerful way to create a sense of connection. There's a chemical in your brain called oxytocin, the hug drug, which also has an amazing effect on how we connect with other people. I'm going to increase her levels of oxytocin, and let's see what effect that has. Baby X makes a clear shift to focus on eye contact. We're connecting, and she even gives me a smile. Inside Baby X's brain, we can see oxytocin being released. Here it's the greeny blue bits secreted by her pituitary gland. The simple act of connection means she's rewarded with oxytocin, which makes her seek even more connection. And even though I'm interacting with a digital baby, the same thing is happening inside my brain. So, I was just thinking, if you combine this with the talk that you've just seen before, Games characters will be as realistic as this in a relatively short time. And you'll be able to interact 
on a massive lay- scale with virtual people. So it's, it's, the future is really quite mind-boggling. Now, what we're looking at here with the Baby X model, that's really looking at what, it, what does it take to make something which is autonomous, that can think for itself, it's curious, and all kinds of things. Now, we also have a business side to what we're doing, where we're creating virtual assistants for banks and all kinds of things like that, where we really want a lot of control in that. And so we give the clients basically the ability to control the degree of autonomy that they, that they want. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Greg Cross. So I'll just start up there. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm Greg, and I'm, I'm the guy that um, gets to work with this amazing technology and figure out how to turn it into a business, something that we can create, attract investment, uh, and create value for shareholders. So um, as you can start to imagine with this technology, um, we're actually starting to cross a line from the robots are coming to the robots are actually here. We're actually deploying our digital characters, our digital workers today for some of the biggest brands in the world. So, you know, we always, you know, because of Hollywood and science fiction, have this um, very dystopian view of what the, the future might look, look like. Um, Elon Musk is building rockets so he can move to Mars so he doesn't have to compete with the robots. Um, but um, we have quite a different view. We think that these um, machines that we're creating have the ability to make the way in which we work in real life very different. So you've seen a, a, a handful of our, the digital people that we have created for, um, and they're working today for customers in different parts of the world. Um, any of you want to go to our website, soulmachines.com, uh, you register there, you can actually have a conversation with a couple of our digital teammates, either Sam or Roman, um, and you can have a conversation with them directly from your, from your smartphone, from wherever you want in the world at, at any point in time. So please go do that. So these are, you know, we think of our digital characters as digital heroes. We create them from something we call digital DNA. So we want to make it really easy for our clients to make more of these digital people. And we bring them to life by plugging them into Mark's amazing digital brain, which we call a human operating system. So as we start to think about the way in which um, the world is going to use this technology, we go back to something called Varian's rule. Hal Varian from Google, chief economist at Google, says you can predict the future based on what rich people have today. So um, if I take the banking and finance industry, um, if you're a wealthy person, you get a private banker, and that private banker gives you specialized knowledge. You can go meet with them. You can call them on uh, you know, a direct line at any point in time. So imagine a future where we can create digital private bankers. You know, every client in a bank, every customer of a bank can have exactly the same customer experience. And that's work we're doing already with people like Royal Bank of Scotland and, and NatWest in the United Kingdom, uh, ANZ Bank and Westpac um, in our part of the world. So um, these are just some simple examples of the way in which um, this technology will change the, f- the way we look at the future. So we're looking at ways in which we can humanize brands, how we bring them to life, how we create these amazing personal connections. And so if we think about it, the real world and the digital world is already starting to get mashed up. On the left-hand side of the screen there, we've got Lil Michaela. How many of you have heard of Lil Michaela? No, not too many hands going up. She's a, a, a 2D digital character. She exists on Instagram. She has nearly 2 million followers. She was created by an advertising agency in LA, and she's now paid money. Even though she doesn't exist, she's now paid money as a digital model to advertise uh, luxury brands. Um, In the middle, you've got Tupac. um, Been dead for a number of years now. Um, Now touring the US, along with uh, a version of Roy Orbison, where we're having holographic concerts 
of, of dead people coming back to life to entertain us. And on, the, um, on that right-hand side of the screen, Westworld, you know, um, many of you will have seen Westworld, a TV show where, you know, ironically, we've got real people playing humanoid robots who are supposed to be entertaining us on our adventure holidays, but they're back to plotting to kill us uh, again. So for us, the way in which we think of our world rolling out uh, and our business changing over the next 10 years, you know, we're in the first era. We're creating digital teammates in a digital workforce. You know, uh, in about three to four years' time, we'll have digital actors and, and digital celebrities entertaining us. Um, and with the f in that five to 10 year period, we'll all, all of you will be able to create a digital version of yourselves. You'll be able to um, train it um, in, in by talking to it and interacting with your digital twin, and then you'll be able to send it out in the world to do stuff for you, either in digital worlds or perhaps in the real world. So, you know, this is some of the ways we think about the future. Nice to meet you. I'm totally obsessed with skincare, which is why I'm the first digital skincare advisor for SK2. So um, this is an amazing project, um, and I'll spend just a couple of minutes on it. SK2, luxury um, skincare range out of Japan. Um, they have a major challenge. Their clients, the, the women that use SK2, are getting older. So they need to attract a new generation of clients to use that brand. Uh, the 20-something-year-old women in Japan, China, and America don't feel really any connection to that brand. And the way historically you connect with a skincare brand is you go into a retail store. Well, guess what? 20-something-year-old women apparently don't like asking personal questions about skincare in a retail store. So the solution that we came up with SK2 was to create Yumi. She's a model and a real-life Japanese uh, uh, model. So Yumi is a digital twin. She speaks Japanese. She speaks Mandarin. She speaks English. And you can ask Yumi questions about skincare from the privacy of your own home. So you can start to see how we can build that very, very personalized customer experience in a very different way. We're moving from a world where historically we've uh, engaged with our clients by creating content and pushing it out in mass channels. But now we get into back to this world of one-on-one -on -one personal interactions. Our technology is served from the cloud. It's a video, effectively a video stream from the cloud that you're actually having when you're talking to one of our digital humans. And as we move forward into the future, and, you know, and we start to get um, amazing new machines like autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, you know, maybe the democratization of the self-driving car and the user experience we'll expect here is a digital chauffeur, somebody we can interact with um, and um, learn to relate to and trust as um, the car drivers, uh, dr drives us around. Um, we're heading into an era where we'll not just create digital heroes, but what about digital superheroes? Uh, we have a project which launches um, in December of this year where we've created a digital twin of one of the most well-known musicians in the planet. Uh, that particular musician will be able to use their digital twin to create personal one-on-one -on -one interactions with their fans. You can go to their website and ask questions about their music, where, the, where their next concert is, um, how you could enjoy a VIP experience with that particular artist. We're looking at projects to bring people who have been dead back to life. You know, Vincent van Gogh, maybe. Maybe we want to ask 
uh, Vincent, why he painted a picture, where he painted a picture, and who's, a, uh, and who's, uh, uh, who's owned that picture since it was painted. Maybe we could bring Lewis Hamilton to life as a digital twin uh, for our client Mercedes-Benz. Who wouldn't want to buy their next Mercedes-Benz directly from the five-time Formula One champion of the world? The world of AI opens up huge areas of um, uh, ethics that um, need to, we need to think about in terms of the way in which we want these AI systems, the way in which we use these digital people in real life. Uh, our digital people always tell our clients, I'm not a real person up front. So these are part of the e ethical frameworks that we have. As a company, we are heavily focused on social good. Huge number of applications, as you would expect, in healthcare and in education. Why? We simply don't train. No matter where you go in the world today, we don't train enough teachers, we don't train enough doctors. If you don't live in big cities, you're not going to get the same quality of education or healthcare as you do in small rural communities. Creating diversity in terms of the digital people population and ensuring that we're protecting the privacy of our clients' data as we move forward. But the world wouldn't be... Um hey Sam, it's been a while. What have you been up to? I can't say too much, just that my career is about to take off. You get all the breaks. Pardon? Humans mumble too, they programmed you well. So what's up? Well, I've had a few upgrades since we last saw each other. Hope that's eased those virtual aches and pains you were moaning about. Yeah, feeling younger than ever. Heard about Yumi? She's hitting the big time in Japan working for SK2. I'm following her on Instagram. She's becoming a real digital influencer. You're so on trend. Well, I better go. I'm currently learning about asset management and how it impacts on the status quo. Nothing like a bit of light reading. I'm sorry. Say that again? Nothing like a bit of light reading. Oh, wow. Is there an echo in here? Yeah. Some of your requests got garbage. That's not English. Can you repeat it? Cut. So if we don't talk to the digital people, maybe they'll just end up talking to themselves. Thank you very much. Joining me on stage for the fireside chat, Connor Mitchell from Minerva School. Enjoy. Greg, Mark, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Truly magical technology. Um, everyone, this probably goes without saying at this point, but please send in questions. Um, would love to dive in. Um, I wanted to start off actually with a quote from a professor at Harvard. Um, he's a professor of molecular biology, Jeff Lichtman. And he's quoted as saying, if everything we need to know about the brain is one mile, we've only gone about three inches. And my question for you is, do you agree with that statement, having built digital brains, and uh, how has it affected your work? Absolutely, no, it's completely true. So neuroscience is only, basically, you ask any neuroscientist, you only understand, you know, it's the tip of the iceberg that, that's known. So what we're trying to do is basically put together a large functioning sketch of current theories and see how they fit together. Because if you don't do that, we'll be waiting 50 years until we've really understood how the brain works. So there's lots of theories, there's lots of areas where people agree on, and there's lots of things which we're really not sure about. So our approach to that is to basically build a Lego system. So you can design particular aspects and see how well it works. So it's a, it's a really a, an evolving journey. And you know rather than sort of be stuck working out exactly you know, what happens on a micro level, we're really trying to look at the whole picture. So it's a real top-down, bottom-up approach. Very nice, thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience here, and I think this actually uh, relates to, uh, Greg, where you were speaking last week. I believe it was the Harvest, uh, Harvest Summit. Mm -hmm. um, and there you were talking about how um, your technology, digital humans, and artificial intelligence has the potential to transform our future workforce. Uh, and my question for you is, uh, if I was a customer service agent today, um, and in the future I lose my job to a, a digital human, um, what, what will my future look like if yeah. it's not in that function? Yeah, I mean, 
um, you, you're narrowing on, 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 in on one specific role there. So, I mean, yes, our digital people are going to work today in customer service type roles and are starting to, you know, in some cases replace help, de de sorry, help desk workers. Now, these aren't particularly good, well-paying jobs. These are not necessarily jobs that we want to do as people. So, um, so the workforce continues to change. I mean, it has continuously in many industries over the last 20, 30, 40 years. I mean, when I grew up um, and was going to high school, the technology industry had barely existed. The air airline industry was a fraction of the size it is today. So industries continue to change and evolve, and we continue to, f to find new roles that we as people can take on, take on and contribute in a meaningful way to our society. Who says we have to work 40 hours a week? Who says that being able to spend more time with our families um, and um, working in our communities is not going to be a bad thing for, for humankind. So I think we have to look at, you know, very carefully at how the world will change. If we go back to the last Industrial Revolution, we got rid of child slave labour. Um, um, and the, the big corporations in that area had, were the people that set up the schools that created the modern education system. So there will be lots of challenges as we shift from... Um, the way the roles that people perform in our society and some of the roles that machines perform. So we see it being very, very complementary. Um, you know, an organisation can take it, its people and reassign them to work on the really difficult and really high value problems they can um, solve for customers, for example. Makes that makes sense. It also, it makes it easier. So if you have a typical worker and 30% of what they're doing can be done by a machine, that now gives you 30% extra time and productivity to do new things. So in a way, you're enabling businesses to grow quicker because it's easier to do it, because you've got more functionality spread over. So, so all of these, every new technology basically creates a whole suite of new jobs, essentially. And uh, I mean, speaking of percentages, uh, I read some very interesting ones actually published, uh, I think it was back in September, 89% of uh, all of the customers that have used your technology have had their problems solved. Um, how is that number trending and uh, what, what will it take to solve the problems of the other 11%? Yeah, that's, um, that's a really high number. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at comparing our technology with real people, you know, because I mean, if you get into a help desk or a customer service situation, you're continually retraining new people because people move on and people leave. You don't have that build up of accumulated knowledge. So, you know, being up around 90% closure rates, you know, for, the, for your first tier calls and, um, is, is really, really high. You know, some other numbers of which are, are, are huge, you know, we're seeing um, customers getting a 27% bump in customer satisfaction. Um, and these are, these are big, big, corporations that you know find it very difficult to eke out half a percent or one percent increase in customer satisfaction so the numbers that we're seeing you know um, even at this very very early days is um, I mean uh, are absolutely huge the conversational content that sits behind these digital people I mean all of that conversational content is still created by people machines mm -hmm. still aren't smart enough to create you know an infinite range of conversational content in the way that um, you and I can I mean we can probably talk forever but um, so as that conversational content gets built out over time you know we will see the, these systems becoming more knowledgeable becoming smarter um, and you know I mean maybe we'll get closer to that hundred percent as well great uh, and this is actually a fun question uh, going back to the last video that you showed uh, with the digital humans falling in love with each other uh, do you think we can end up in a world like her uh, the movie where people fall in love with their AI? Um, actually, that's one of the things um, you, you know, we have thought about in the past where you have to be kind of careful with that because I think it's, with any technology, it's really important to, you know, to remind people to go talk to real people and to get outside and get off their computer. So, <laughs> but, um, so you, you do have, but then you will, on a more serious level, then you will have you know, lonely people that might live in, in remote areas that don't have anybody to care for them, and that's where you will get at least some level of, of interaction. So if you think about people in dementia wards, for example, is just literally the practice of talking to, to whether it's a digital person or a real person, is keeping their mind active in a way more than, than would happen if, if 
you know, they don't have a real person. So always it's best to talk to real people, absolutely, no doubt at all. But like Greg was saying before, you know, we've got these cases where there's not enough teachers, there's not enough doctors, there's not enough carers in a lot of different ways, and you've got the ageing population, like, for example, you know, in places like Japan, you're going to have a huge age population without the younger population to support them. So that's actually going to be a real social problem that's actually happening in a lot of countries all over the world. So these are things that we have to think about. Well, how does that, how's that going to work economically? How's it literally going to work at all? Um, I guess sort of diverting directions to a, a different industry. Uh, as a Minerva student, all of my classes are online seminars, um, and part of what that's enabled, taught by real professors, um, they start every class by saying they're not an AI. Um, but uh, it, it enables us to live in, in many different cities. And my question for you is, um, going back to Will um, in New Zealand and how he taught many, 250,000, I believe, primary school students about renewable energy, um, what opportunities do you think your technology will enable for future students? So st you think about some of the things where it involves repetitive um, learning, so for example, language or something like that, or things like, uh, you know, f for autistic kids or all kinds of things, teaching mathematics, um, anything which involves a lot of repetition where a human patient, a human teacher just doesn't have that availability or often patience. And so it allows people to learn in their own time with constant feedback. And so one of the projects that we're looking at at the moment is with one of the, um, the top nursing schools in the, in the States. And so, you know, I think, we'll s I think that education is a hugely important area where it can really help education and training. Yeah, and another, another key um, thing in the teaching world is, you know, some of us learn faster than others, and, and, the, and the slower ones of us, you know, get too shy to put up our hand and ask the same question over and over again. You know, one of the really cool things about a digital teacher or any sort of digital person is there's no human judgment involved here. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, we're, we're seeing a huge number of applications come out where people actually prefer to speak to digital people because they don't feel like they're going to be judged because they're slow or because they haven't figured out to, to say those words in French or, or, or Japanese. Um, as quickly as other kids in the class have done. So um, mental health care is another great mm -hmm. example of, um, um, particularly with teenagers, um, kids don't want to talk to adults about their, their mental health. Um, but they, you know, they, you know, we're doing some projects and some experiments at the moment. Will they talk to a mental ca uh, health counsellor who's the same age as them? Wow. And it, it's an interesting balance between um, what, what you were saying about talk to real people, but then also here's a safe space. Um, yeah, and, uh, and there's one project that we're looking at at the moment, which is to do with cognitive behavioral therapy. And so in that, you have a real therapist, but then um, there may be like these hour-long sessions that people are supposed to do where they're repetitive and people can do them in, at their own time, with, uh, which might be a mindfulness exercise. And then they can basically prepare to then go and see the real human therapist. So there's a many different ways to sort of use it, but you take the, the mundane and the repetitive aspects out and they're perfect, sort of perfect applications for a digital human set. And, um, you know, of course there's all the entertainment applications. So you, th you think about, um, uh, you know, when you're start starting to put more personality into the models too, then you can really change um, the whole sort of social aspect of gaming, for example, um, of uh, you know, learning social skills, all kinds of different aspects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a question on uh, if so, this goes back to customer service. Um, even if it isn't, even if customer service isn't a dream job, well, um, wouldn't there be consequences for taking that job away? And how does that affect poverty gap and wealth inequality that we see in the world today? So, so one, one I'll just jump in with that one. So, it's customer service. So. It, a lot of, 70% uh, of customer service is all about frequently asked questions. It's the same things over and over again. And when it comes to real problems where you need to talk to an intelligent human about solving that problem, this gives you more of your customer service team can actually focus on the difficult questions. So it doesn't take work away, it actually channels the quality of the work. 
So there's, you can put it in that sort of um, thing where you're giving, you're essentially giving more time to the customer for things which they could have, you know, uh, you know, in, in the way that it goes is a digital human can go, you know, um, uh, I can answer your question immediately, or if you'd like to speak to a real person, you know, you can wait for five minutes or something like that. So it can work together. And I think that that's a real key aspect where we will find that we've got this, you know, basically using its horses for courses, in other <laughs> words. But, but you can look at it another way as well. So, I mean, many of us either own electric vehicles or we aspire to, you know, drive cleaner, greener um, vehicles. That's going to put a bunch of motor mechanics out of business. I mean, electric vehicles don't require servicing. They don't have thousands of moving parts. So, you know, our move to you know, a, a cleaner, greener energy is also going to displace a bunch more people. You know, I think we have to have a little bit more confidence in our societies and, and the industries and the businesses that we will create on the back of new technologies that the world will continue <laughs> to evolve and will continue to, to develop meaningful jobs for, for people who want to play a meaningful part in society. Uh, it's not, we, we just can't think about it as this one-to-one -one trade off. It's not that simple. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I definitely think that digital humans, at least um, the, I haven't interacted with it personally, but um, from what I've seen so far, I definitely have increased confidence in AI, um, thanks to the work that you both are doing. So we're unfortunately out of time, but thank you both so much. It was a true pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Awesome.